Welcome to Real Women Real Estate, episode eight. Whoop whoop! Woo-hoo. Yay! Eight episodes. Episode eight, already in. So today's episode is all about loans. We'll be breaking down the process and getting back to basics with lending. And um, I wanted to introduce myself. I am Courtney. I'm Kimberly. I'm Ebony. We got to do intros before we get started. So welcome, ladies. Welcome to the episode. I'm excited about this episode. When I was buying my house, there were so many questions I had about the lending process, and I didn't ask them. I just kind of went with um, went, went what the realtor told me to do. And, uh, you know, I just there was just more information I wish I would have had hindsight so that's what we are want to share today and i'll start off with the um the first question which is what is a mortgage lender wait courtney we forgot to do the quote oh we did forget to do the quote thank you (laughs) i appreciate you telling me that (laughs) this is why you do the intros right all right so introduce quote for the day which is the late great Nelson uh, Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's done. I like uh, it. That's for all you dreamers out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, powerful words from the great. Okay, so back to the question now. What is a mortgage lender? A mortgage uh, a mortgage is a loan. First of all, it's a loan um, on a property. Uh, if you want to buy real property or land, you want to reach out to a mortgage lender for that loan as collateral. Uh, the borrower uh, then enters into an, a, an agreement with the lender, which is usually a bank. And we'll get into that different types, uh, wherein the borrower receives cash up front and then makes payments over time uh, during the servicing of the loan. And then uh, he pays back the lender in full with the majority of that being interest. So you have your yeah. principal and the majority of that is going to be interest. Okay. Yeah. That's so great. I just want to make a quick note here. Okay. Because the people get real estate and mortgage mixed up. Real estate is the property. You can have a real estate property without having a mortgage on it. But most of the time, if you have a property, you're going to need a mortgage and a mortgage lender. So Mm -hmm. there's a fine line there, but they go hand in hand. So very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, help me. Maybe you can uh, help us out and go ahead and pose number four up. (laughs) (laughs) Sure, Courtney. (laughs) So, so you may be asking yourself, why do I care about a lender? I'm a first time home buyer. I'm coming from renting. Why is a lender important to me? So if you are a first time home owner or home buyer, or important note, if you haven't owned a home in three years, you're still considered a first time home buyer in a lot of programs. But if you're a first time home buyer, you're new to this show, um, a lender will help you determine how much home you can afford. They will partner with you to see how much you need for a down payment. Um, and they will assist you with what types of programs you may qualify for. So. That's super important. A lot of times people get excited when they think about buying a home and they go pull up, you know, they look online for what type of home they want, but they forget to talk to the money person, which would be the lender first, right, Courtney? How many times has that happened right. to you? <laughs> exactly. No, and, I, and then the one thing that I forgot to do when I bought my home was shop around for rates. When you lock yourself in, you can lock in with uh, that one lender or once you get that hard, uh, inquiry on your credit. You can shop around uh, depending on your situation. It may be good to go with one lender versus the other. Yes. And then also a quick note about interest. You hear interest rates and interest getting thrown around a lot, but it's important to remember that lenders are in business. They're there to make money. So the way they make money is by interest, how much it costs for you to borrow that money that they're lending you. So that's where you hear the term interest rate. When the interest rate is low, you hear, you know, nowadays with the coronavirus pandemic going on, they're dropping interest rates because they're encouraging people to come and buy money so they can stay in business, right? Versus 
versus when, you know, interest rates are higher, they're trying to slow down that supply of money and make it a little bit more difficult for people to access those funds. So that's something to, to, to consider if you're in the market for buying a home, you know, interest can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and, um, and I want to say that interest and points go hand in hand. You'll hear that term as well. Um, or a new home buyer buying the points down on the interest to lower the interest rate um, over the over the course of the loan. So you hear that too. Uh, the next question. I feel like we should get Kimberly in here. Kimberly, what are you doing? She's here. I'm, I'm here waiting the live. <laughs> <laughs> so Kim, maybe you can help us understand because a lot of our audience is, you know, they're first time home buyers. They're getting out of the renting game. Um, so, you know, we definitely want to speak to you guys about first time home buyers, but we also have another market of our audience that are investors. They already own a home, right? And they're thinking about kicking it up a notch, creating another stream of income by maybe buying some, some rental properties. And I know that's something that you're into, right? right. You're into buying rental properties. So right. can you tell us how a lender is useful if you're an investor? <clears throat> right. So... I can just speak to what we're, what's going on in um, my um, household at the moment is, right? So you can get, you can own a house, right? And a lot of people that are listening already own their first home and are looking to be first time um, landlords or, or, you know, what have you. So um, you can get um, a conventional loan, um, which is a type of loan. So we've discussed that in previous, um, we've discussed that in previous podcast episodes. Right. Of type. Yeah. You can get certain types, right? But if you have, say you have like, for instance, our house is an FHA, you can get a conventional loan and have a conventional loan and an FHA out and you can have the second home as a um, investment property. So okay. that's what we're doing right now. We, we are currently looking for a rental and or owner finance house right now. And we have a loan out or we have a pre-approval for a loan amount and we're looking for an investment property. So that when people are talking about how to use a lender and still get property, this is one way that you can do that is by taking out another loan. And yeah. um, you can still yeah. own your own home and take out another loan to have an investment property. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, it is that's important the to process, know. right? Yep. Yeah. That's the burr process, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then you refinance it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it is important to note that getting an investment property loan can be harder um, than getting one if you're going to be owner occupied. So it is very important to partner with a lender that understands your goals and can help you find the right loan type. To right. Kimberly's point, you can use a conventional loan uh, for an investment property loan. If that lender knows what they're doing, they can also assist you with getting um, like the right type of FHA loan or VA loan um, that you can use for investment property. So, right. you know, definitely want a lender on your team. Yes. Um, so if you are going to go the conventional investment property route, keep in mind, most lenders are going to want to see a down payment of at least 20%. Um, and that's important because if you want a lower rate, you're going to need to make a bigger down payment. However, uh, there are <laughs> options because currently we have a 0% down payment. We are only paying closing costs, which we plan to roll into our notes. So for instance, the property we're looking for right now, is one that's under 200K. And so we're looking in the range of 180, 195, and we want to roll in some of those closing costs that we may incur into the note. That way we come out of pocket $0. And that is exactly, so we don't have a down payment at all. It's zero down payment. But again, these are, this is prime time, especially during COVID <laughs> to yeah, actually right. try and do all of this. And then that's another way, because I think people think we've talked about this before in the last episode, but I think people think, oh no, people aren't buying houses right now. That's not true. People are it's buying not. houses. This is yeah. prime time to start investing. So if you are interested in investing, this is a prime time to potentially get started if you have the ancillary income and have the, you know, the funds or the, the credit score. Because at the end of the day, if you're going with a lender, you don't necessarily need upfront cash. Because like I said, there are programs where you can get a 0% down payment, especially right Right now so you can yeah. get your percent down and then you have then you just need the credit score so, so with, Kim, i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut no, you go off. ahead 
Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you got your pre-approval before COVID. So how did you do a pre-approval with no down payment? How did you do that? Because I'm a G. No. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of times it it was just an offering that um, we are actually going through Navy Federal and they have an offering. And by the way, Navy Federal is not one that you have to be you have to be in the uh, military or government for, you can actually apply by just having a lot of credit unions are like that, right? You just need to be a member or ha- open an account. So our kids' accounts are at Navy Federal and we just, I just so happened to somehow pro- cross it and I was like, what is this 0% down, down payment on a conventional mm-hmm. loan? And I was like, oh snap. So that's what happened. And we pr- applied and they were like, oh yeah, here you go, boom. And that was it. I mean, we just have our kids' accounts. Our, we don't even have accounts there. Just the kids do. Well, we do because of the kids. But you know what I mean. Like, it's not my, I don't bank there. And, um, but yeah, they definitely were like 0% down is what we're doing right now. And that was before COVID. But they're definitely doing it right now. And the interest rates are so low right now, which is big yeah. on refinancing, right? And I think they do that to, to, so they can have the rest of your business. Um, that's yeah, another absolutely. thing that those depository banks will do. They'll offer more competitive rates to a lower risk um, client. So there's not really a risk to them. And they're going to make money because they actually service the loan as well. Right. So um, oh, yeah, they'll that. offer more competitive, Wait, competitive rates. Courtney, what's a depository so, bank? So depository bank is like your large banks, your Bank of America, your Wells and Chase, things like that. So they want all your business, right? They want their direct deposit money. Because they feel like if you do your mortgage with us, then you're probably going to do something else with us. We want all your oh, business. Oh, okay. Right? Like but we don't want you shop. to be, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And so that's how they're going to make their money off of you, fees, things like that. Oh, so, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah. They want all your business. And um, yeah, I believe they service the loan. So that's another thing that they can offer uh, uh, cheaper rates because everything's in the house. Yeah. So. That's okay. I like it. This is good information. So credit scores. So that's another thing that um, a mortgage lender or a lender is looking at. That's that's actually the main thing that they're looking at is your credit score. And I think there's another misconception with people about, you know, obtaining their credit score. So it's actually three scores uh, that they look at are three different companies and they take the median range score in order to, um, you know, that'll trigger what what actual interest rate that you're going to get. And so it's good to, it's good to find out. A lot of people just are afraid to find out or they think because they had, you know, whatever happened in the past, but uh, credit lenders look at different, uh, different things. So different things are important to them. You may think that, you know, medical bill, you know, it just depends on what your situation is. Uh, What you may feel like is dinging your credit score, hurting your credit score could be something really simple. And they also have ways uh, to fix it because they want your business. So they have an incentive to help you. Correct. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And if it's a good lender, yeah, if it's a good lender, they will go, number one, they're not going to make you feel ashamed if your credit is less than perfect. Um, If they're, if they know what they're doing, then they have resources available. Like Courtney just said, they have resources available to help you find um, something that's going to make sense for you in the long term. Because one thing people don't understand about credit a lot of times is that it fixes itself. If you yeah. are the type of consumer that banks want to see and you pay your, your bills on time and you don't, you know, overextend yourself on credit, your credit will naturally, you know, bounce up. It's when, you know, you run into tough circumstances or, you know, maybe there's a job change or something like that and your credit takes a ding. Most lenders understand that. The type of lender, the type of credit scores that lenders don't like and the clients that I used to have was people who just didn't understand how credit works. And, yeah. you know, they never, you know, they didn't understand the relationship between making payments and what type of credit to use. So credit is a tool. That's why I used to tell my clients, it's a tool, right? You pick it up when you need it. You put it down when you don't need it. Right. <laughs> That's exactly. the best way I can explain it. But again, um, the better your credit score, the lower your interest rates are going to be, the lower your fees are going to be, and the lower your, um, your LTV is going to be. So. Right, they get loan to value ratio. They want to make sure that too, that um, yeah. Unless you're going with like a mortgage bank, right? So those mortgage banks, yeah. those are the um, the Quicken loans and the Rocket mortgages. Those those places, you know, those are gonna be high. Those yeah. those are, are gonna be high? because they're actually really competitive right now. Um, I thought. 
Yeah, I think right now, right? But they they, they don't service the loan. So, okay, so they don't average, service it. They're, they're yeah, they're gonna they're gonna send that out. So if you you want to find out when you do purchase a home, do you just ask that question? Do you service the loan or do you shop or do you um, send it. that out to a third party? Sell it. Exactly. Thank you. That's a um, super important question. Yeah. Because you don't know who's gonna be sending your bills uh, to the to the house, right? So it's yeah. something to ask. And, and it changes. I have seen right. it, yeah. I've seen that trigger foreclosures because when that first lender sells off your mortgage to a servicer, there's usually like a gap. A delay. Right? Yes. It's a yeah. delay. Yeah. It's, the foreclosures, you're right. Yes. Yeah. I have seen that happen. And you know, if you I don't if you guys are nerds like me and you just want to see like some examples of that, you can go look up Aquin. Aquin Loan oh, Servicing. Oh gosh, don't yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> you can go look up Aquin. And a lot of those people are from the mortgage crisis, but also some of those people were just, you know, they had they had their mortgages before the mortgage crisis and they had been making their payments on time. They were used to it, you know, going a certain way. And then when those mortgages start getting sold off again and again, you know, things get lost in translation. And next thing you know, the payments you have been spending, you know, those three months, a thousand dollar payments you have been sending don't exist anymore. It hasn't been applied to your loan. And now you're at a new, a new servicer and you're in foreclosure. So that is something that is super important to Courtney's point. Ask, ask the lender, you know, do you uh, service these loans or do you sell them? And then just make a decision based on how you do your personal finances. Are you okay if there's like an interruption in your, in your mortgage servicing and you have to make some extra payments until they catch up or like, will a mess up like that mess up your personal finances that's up to your you know you based on how you do your personal banking let's avoid aquin at all all, all costs <laughs> girl people made money off of that we'll talk later <laughs> it's sad but it's true people made a lot of money off of that that was one of the biggest the wholesale deal we did last year was with aquin and we almost the lady almost foreclosed because of the fact that a lot of times that's a whole nother topic that we could do on the podcast but they they don't they don't want you to stop the foreclosure let's be clear because then they can sell the loan and a, they can sell the loans as a lump loan with other people who are foreclosing at the same time to a bigger person because they're a third party right so they're selling mm -hmm. 10 or 20 at a time and get a better deal than if they were just selling that one so you stopping the foreclosure and bringing them out of foreclosure you're now a threat to them that's yeah. another topic <laughs> We got them out. However, it was it. It took a lot. It took to the very last. It took finesse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. It took some finessing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We yeah. just went down some rabbit holes. But. Absolutely. <laughs> we have those experiences. <laughs> memories mm -hmm. right there. <laughs> All yeah. right. So um, some lenders won't even um, you know care about your credit. So or are your employment history as yeah. long as they see the potential the potential in you that are are either your investment properties and things like that so go yeah. out there and invest don't be afraid yeah. yep and don't be scared. yeah get out it's there it's done people think you know and and honestly real estate is the backbone of the country so it's easier than people think absolutely you know yeah. especially especially now i'm so glad that you guys are considered you know really essential during this COVID time. Was that thunder? What was that? <laughs> Say that again, uh, Kim. Say what you were saying again. We'll edit that out. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> what the hell was that? And was that, a, is that on your end, Kim? People watching the live just know this is live. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that purpose. was. <laughs> Man. Um, End of the world. So, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. I, <laughs> I don't even know. But um, yeah. <laughs> I did want to yeah. make a note. Um, so we were talking about, you know, using a conventional loan as an investment tool to get an investment property. So you hear about people who have like multiple investment properties. Nine times out of ten, they they didn't get all of those with a conventional loan, right. and you don't necessarily want to because that can that can overextend you if you're not careful. Some <laughs> lenders, it, once you <laughs> Who, where is that coming from? I don't know. Oh my god! 
<laughs> okay, y'all, this is raw behind the scenes. <laughs> you guys are getting behind the scenes for next week's episode. Oh my god, oh my god, is somebody in here with me? <laughs> oh girl, be careful, lock your door. <laughs> it is locked. Oh my god, this is too much. Oh, okay. See, they had a stand up. Pause. Okay. okay. So, uh, no, I was saying that, um, you know, once you have four mortgages on your credit, a lot of conventional lenders don't want to work with you because if something happens, which is what we're seeing now, you know, with this COVID pandemic, if you're overextended on your mortgages and something happens to where your renters can't make their payments, by that point, the lenders know that this is this is residual income for you you're building a business and you know if your if your renter can't make their payment then the first thing to go oftentimes is your mortgage and and if it's not your personal mortgage then you have less incentive to keep it and you can default on it and go into foreclosure you don't care so a lot of times once you have four mortgages on your credit you would want to look into options such as hard money lending private money lenders or personal, um, uh, what are those things called where you use uh, insurance? I forget the name of it, but you could, it gets real creative <laughs> in real estate. And once you get your feet in and, you know, start, start trying out different properties and meeting new people, you'll see that you don't necessarily have to re rely on an investment, uh, investment loan. Um, like you would your personal property, but yeah, just so you know, like these people out here, you see what a, a large rental portfolio, all of those mortgages are not conventional loans. So. Okay. No, I appreciate that. That was all. <laughs> Why are you laughing? This... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I cannot with you guys. Oh, oh goodness. Gosh. Okay. <laughs> oh, get it together. You got to get that serious face on. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. I'm sorry. Okay. So we talked about, we threw, we threw around a lot of terms. Can we pause? Okay. <laughs> we threw Key around terms. a lot of terms. Way, way to get it back on track, Ebony. Yes, Key terms. Thank you. Get it, get we it threw we threw out a lot of terms and I really, you know, encourage you for beginners, you know, if you are a first time homeowner, if you are like really considering buying a property, whether it's your property you're going to live in or an investment property, I, I a hundred percent guarantee you're going to do better if you just take some time to do your research and network and get to Absolutely. know people. Um, but you know, we want to just explain some of the key terms we talked about. Uh, I, I, I said DTI, which is debt to income, that's going to be the percentage of your, your monthly gross income, meaning income before taxes and deductions that goes towards paying your debt. So the ideal debt to income ratio is between 28 and 30 percent. If it gets over the over 30 percent or 38 percent for some lenders, they're going to look at you like you're overextended, meaning that, you know, if something happens with your income, then your debts are going to default and oftentimes it's going to be the mortgage which makes you a high risk. Right. So nobody um, wants to take a chance on a high risk client or your interest rates are going to be really, really high, which brings us to the next um, term, which is principal insurance, taxes and insurance. And you'll often hear that as P-I-T-I, right? Pity, um, pity. Pity, right? Pity on you. And so your principal will probably be a smaller amount in regards to your, your amortization, but your interest payments start off usually really usually on the higher end. So it's really good to, that's why you'll see people getting 10 year uh, loans or 15 years to try, not try to um, extend out all of these interest payments over the course of a 30 year loan. Uh, they want to get that, keep that interest rate down as much as possible. But of course, it will double your mortgage payment. So if you have saved money, then you can do that. And you'll also, of course, have to pay your taxes. You got to pay property taxes on the house. And, uh, and you need to insure your home. So all of that is usually rolled in uh, to your mortgage. And you'll get that nice big check or that nice big invoice every month. Yeah. It is important to know also that if you, um, depending on your loan terms, you can do your insurance privately 
and your taxes mm-hmm. privately, it wasn't it won't require an escrow account. But if you are like a doing an FHA loan or doing um some sort of like zero down payment or yeah, VA, you know, low yep. payment loan, yeah, then you're gonna have an attached escrow account which means your payments are going to be higher typically every month, but you also don't have to worry about making like a lump sum payment for taxes or having like separate insurance payments. So again, that goes back to how you do your personal finances. If you know that you're okay with making separate payments and you're disciplined enough to make that, then, you know, don't worry about that. Yeah, but if you know, me. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's too yeah much. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just too much. It's doing too much. Yeah. Um, down payment down payment is um an initial uh upfront uh partial payment for the purchase of the home so you'll hear like 20 percent down which is a myth you do not need 20 percent down to purchase a home we know this uh kim has told us about her deals you do not need you does not need to happen this is a myth uh if you want to keep your interest as low as possible and you want to appear as though you're risk-free and maybe you're um your what do you call it your credit score is high and so yeah you would want to have a larger down payment so that hey i'm actually not risky with my credit score i um i have a large down payment for you all right lastly we have your mortgage term your, oh, i just kind of talked about that you know your mortgage terms so yep. uh it's the length of the time that you calculate your payments the length of, of the time that your uh, mortgage is amateurized over over the life of the loan and that can either be 30 years you could, it's really up to you. 15 yeah it's really up to you uh how you want to structure structure the loan yeah and if you don't mind paying more every month to have a shorter term and pay off your loan faster then a 15 year is you know not a bad idea if you know the idea of paying more every month kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies and you don't mind paying more total then you know a 30-year term is is really common and a lot of people prefer 30 years over 15 years so yeah and then you want to get like a renter in there and pay down a mortgage so you're not worried about it you just got cash flow coming in yeah, so I would not ahead. recommend a. Oh, sorry. I I would not mm-hmm. recommend a fifteen year mortgage if you are an investing property because exactly. it's going to be hard to get cash flow if you have a higher payment. The higher your payment, the more payment or rent you have to charge a renter in order to see cash flow. Yeah, Absolutely. fifteen year loans would be if this is your forever home, right? So, and it's interesting because like my my grandpa talks about his house um, or houses but how back in the day when you got a loan it was only the 15-year loan they didn't have the 30-year option oh really yeah at that time yeah they didn't have it was 15 years so a lot of our grandparents have probably paid off houses because of that and taken out second loans because of that you know because they could against their house because again now they didn't know about my grandpa was like yeah we didn't know anything about 30-year loans but needless to say it's great for us now (laughs) exactly (laughs) Exactly. So you have LTV, sure LTV, right? You are coming in? Tell me, tell me how risky you are. So that's your loan to value uh, ratio. It measures the relationship between the loan amount and the market value of the property, right? So you hear like eighty twenties and things like that. Um, I'm only going to loan you out 80% of the property. You come up with that other 20%. So you'll see those. But nowadays it's popular to do 90-10 or Kim, like she just said, she didn't put anything down for her home. So there's all different types of of things out there. They want to get you motivated. They want to get your business and they want to get you in there so that you can keep the economy going. And this is why not take advantage of it. Why not take advantage of someone and willing to, to help you jumpstart your investment career. Yeah. Yay. So just in case you are on the market and you're looking for a lender, um, the best way to find a lender is to what, Courtney? Partner with a real estate agent or what? How do you find a lender? So you can because because real estate agents do have preferred lenders. We know who we're going to work with. Then when it's time to present your offer as a buyer, we know that the lender, hey, our preferred lender is properly bet at you. And then you can do that and also shop around your rates. You know, don't just take your realtor's word for it. Ask questions. A good realtor is going to tell you shop around your rates, get educated and do some research on your own as well. 
So that means walk into a bank and say, hey, this is me, if you got your credit. If you don't have good credit, don't walk into a bank. <laughs> don't do that. You probably don't want to do that. You probably, because you're going to get a high rate. All right. Credit, credit union. Okay, guys, that's all we have for you. Uh, hope you're enjoying your quarantine. Hope everyone is staying inside and staying healthy and staying safe. Stay home. Um, stay home. Stay home. Stay home. That's right. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us on Real Women Real Estate on Instagram and on Facebook. We also accept emails at realwomenrealestate at gmail.com. So we are here as a resource hey, throughout your I'm quarantine. Like we do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of that, this has been episode eight. Everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.